once we've taken care of the patient's airway and we've made sure that there are no obstructions and that their airway is open, we move on to our next step, which is respirations or breathing. We wanna make sure this person is breathing adequately and that there's no trauma to the chest that is keeping that person from breathing normally. The first thing we do when we approach these patients is we wanna look for any penetrating trauma or any sort of trauma to the chest. And when we talk about chest cavity, we're talking from neck to navel because we want to make sure that we don't miss anything in that area. So neck to navel, look for penetrating trauma. If we find any penetrating trauma or holes or what we would call a sucking chest wound, we wanna place a gloved hand over that. Our immediate fix for that is an occlusive dressing, but immediately we wanna place a gloved hand over that to create a seal to that chest cavity. Once we have the gloved hand in place, then we get our occlusive dressing ready. Now this can be a piece of plastic or preferably a commercial chest seal. These commercial chest seals are great and you can get them vented and non-vented. Definitely prefer the vented. That way it allows any air trapped inside the chest wall to be able to move out, but it doesn't allow that air to go back in. So once you have your occlusive dressing, uh, go ahead and apply that to the patient directly on top of the sucking chest wound or the penetrating trauma. Once you have that in place, we want to check for any secondary wounds. If this is a knife wound or a gunshot wound, there could be an entrance and an exit wound that we need to check for. So always check for that secondary injury, or there could just be a second area of injury that we need to address. So always make sure to check the backs of these patients. These are easily overlooked, especially when the patient is laying flat on the ground on their back. So make sure you roll that patient over and give the back a quick look. Remember that we can use any of the plastic packaging from our chest seal if we only have one chest seal. So if you pull the chest seal off and you place that, you can use that plastic backing on that as your secondary chest seal. Just apply it to the back and tape it on all sides to keep that in place. And a final note on the chest seals is, if we place a seal on that patient's chest and they've got a collapsed lung, there's a chance for air to get trapped inside that chest wall and not be able to escape and thus collapsing that lung even further. So we do want to make sure that we monitor this patient now. And if their breathing seems to get worse, we may have to peel back the corner of that chest seal and what we call burp the chest seal or allow some of that air to escape out of it. So we do want to check that, monitor the patient. And if they end up getting worse, we may need to peel back the side and allow some of that air to escape. That's the beauty of the vented chest seals is they automatically do that for you. So once we have addressed any of the trauma to the chest, now let's dive into rate and quality. We want to look at the rate and the quality of this person's breathing. So the respiratory rate, normal for an adult, would be 12 to 20 times a minute. This is a normal rate for an adult, and pediatrics have a higher metabolism, so they are gonna be normally breathing higher. So if you have a pediatric that's breathing 20 to 30 times a minute, don't be alarmed, this may be normal for them. But note that the adults are 12 to 20 times a minute. So anything outside of that range should key us into, hey, something may be going on here. Don't get too caught up on that because if someone's breathing 22 times a minute, it doesn't mean they're dying or they have a severe disease process. They may just be amped up for some reason or just got done running or something like that. So we just wanna use this as a data point as we're starting to assess this patient. Now, when we mention quality, quality means what is their breathing like? How would you describe it? Is it labored? Is it slow? Is it um, snoring respirations? What is the quality of their breathing? So we're hoping to find someone that's normally breathing. Someone that just looks like they are not having any difficulty breathing, looks like you and I normally would, and that's what we hope for. Something else that we might see though would be a labored breathing. That's when someone is having a hard time breathing. This could be asthma, COPD, and it really looks like they're struggling to be able to get those breaths in and out. Something else we might see is pursed lip breathing. This is when people are um, have their lips pursed. They're putting pressure back against their lungs as they're exhaling. This helps keep their alveoli in their lungs open and helps them to be able to perfuse better. This is a telltale sign of a certain disease process down in their lungs that we should be keyed into. The last point that we want to mention here is snoring respirations. This is typically going to be with someone that's lethargic or unresponsive, and this keys us into the fact that we have not adequately taken care of the airway, and we need to make sure we reposition the airway or reassess the airway treatments that we have already done for this patient so that we can rule that out and make sure that tongue is not occluding the airway. 
So while we are assessing rate and quality on these patients, we're gonna go ahead and take a stethoscope and we wanna to listen to the upper and lower lobes of their lungs. We are listening from one side to the next so that we can listen for any differences between either side. If we have diminished lung sounds or absent lung sounds on one side, that would key us in that we may have a pneumothorax or what we would call a collapsed lung. If they're equal on both sides, but we have some lung sounds that don't sound normal, that may clue us into a certain disease process. So we're listening for things such as strider, wheezing, crackles. Some of those lung sounds would tell us that there's something going on with the lungs and start keying us into what disease process that may be. We'll discuss that in a future video, but I at least wanted to touch on that in this point where we're talking about respirations and breathing. So now that we've talked about assessment of the breathing and respiratory rate, we're gonna move into the treatment side. So on the treatment side, let's talk about oxygen delivery. So we have 21% oxygen in ambient air. When I breathe that 21% in, I take a portion of that oxygen and move that in through my lungs into the bloodstream and out to the cells. If there is a disease process in my lungs that prevents me from being able to absorb that oxygen, one treatment that can buy me some time is to increase the percentage of oxygen that's getting delivered. So instead of 21%, if I have supplemental oxygen and I raise that to 50%, there's a lot more oxygen readily available for my lungs to absorb. So if I have a disease process in my lungs, by increasing the amount of oxygen that my lungs have to absorb, I can hopefully bypass this disease process and get more oxygen into my body to be able to perfuse the cells like they need. So that is one of the initial treatments that we can do for these patients that are having some difficulty breathing, shortness of breath, and low oxygen, is we can increase that oxygen to buy us some time until we can really figure out what is the problem here or until this person can heal and get over that disease process. So there are three primary ways to deliver oxygen to a patient. The first way is a nasal cannula or nasal prongs. Apply this to the patient, set it at two to six liters a minute, and this will deliver 22 to 44% oxygen percentage to this patient. Non-rebreather is our second route. This is a face mask that goes over the patient, and we can put this at 15 liters a minute and deliver somewhere around 90% oxygen to this patient. The last would be a BVM or a bag valve mask. This is when we are actually ventilating for the patient and we're gonna set that at 15 liters a minute on our supplemental oxygen as well. And we're gonna be delivering somewhere close to 100% oxygen with this. Any bypass around that from ambient air would decrease that a little bit, but we're gonna be about 95 to 100% oxygen on this. So we have a patient that's not breathing fast enough. They have slow respirations. We're gonna do rescue breathing for this patient using our BVM. This BVM we're gonna place on their face we have the face mask here that has a point at the top and it's got a uh, more of a curve on the bottom. This is gonna sit on their chin. This is gonna sit right over the bridge of their nose. So we'll place this on the patient. We're gonna use what's called an EC method. So C with my uh, thumb and first finger and we have an E with the other three fingers. We're gonna place the thumb and first finger on the mask, the other three up underneath the jaw down here. And we're gonna use that to help pull the jaw up into the mask and we're gonna push pressure on the mask with our C of our first finger and our thumb. As we deliver this breath now, we're gonna deliver this breath over one second. So one breath, one second in, one second out, and then three more seconds. So we have a total of five seconds for each breath cycle. Just like this. One Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, four Mississippi, five Mississippi, one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, four Mississippi, five Mississippi. And that's how we're gonna breathe for an adult. We're only gonna breathe enough air into their lungs until we see their chest rise. As soon as their chest rise, that means their lungs are full of air and we don't wanna push any more. Any further could cause lung damage or could push air into the stomach, which we don't want either. Remember for pediatrics, we're gonna breathe one breath every three seconds. So this, for a pediatric, it'll look something like this. One breath, out, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Remember pediatrics, we're gonna have smaller lungs, so we only wanna go until we see chest rise, and we're gonna be using much less air for a pediatric. So that's an overview of assessment and treatment for your breathing when we're talking about our ABCs, which is airway, breathing, and circulation. 
So remember, we are going to assess for trauma and treat any penetrating trauma to the chest. Then we're gonna assess for rate and quality, listen with a stethoscope, provide any oxygen if needed and if it's within your scope of practice, and then assist ventilations with a BVM if necessary. That's our overview for airway. Hope you found this video helpful. Go ahead and subscribe to our channel so you get any future video updates as we release them. And like this video if you found it helpful. Leave us a comment on stuff that you would like to see in future training videos. And as always, stay vigilant and stay safe.